things to this. Oh, that's marvelous. Got it. Um, but in spite of all of those little uh, tiny meteorite bits, did Antarctica ever have a big hit? And uh, there was reason to suspect it may have happened. But to really sort this out, we need to uh, do this as a multidisciplinary project, not just uh, exclusive or um, to um, astronomy. And more and more people are understanding the importance of uh, multidisciplinary efforts. And here's one example. So we'll go along and uh, Jack Weihaupt was the principal investigator for much of what I'm going to show you. Uh, he did a lot of different things, but he was an Antarctic explorer. And uh, he and uh, the other chap, uh, uh, Franz van der Hoven, I don't have a picture of him, and but tonight you have a picture of me. <coughs> Jack has now passed away, and so has Franz. Philip, but we'll see what's going on with this concept. Jack took, uh, I think, three snowcats from the coast of Wilkesland to the South Pole, conducting a gravity survey along the way, um, taking a gravity meter with him, and the uh, outcome of that was led up to the point that there are meteor, multiple meteor impacts in Antarctica. So if there's a connection with um, MIS-11, and we'll let you know what that is, then what are the implications for humanity? This is our last uh, publication together. But let's start defining some of the things in here. Uh, marine isotope stage, uh, or marine oxygen isotope stage, or oxygen isotope stages, OIS, that's how it used to be called are alternating warm and cool periods in the Earth's paleoclimate, meaning it's ancient climate, be, uh, well behind us. Uh, and this was deduced from oxygen isotope data, reflecting changes in temperature derived from data in deep sea floor samples. Um, oxygen 18 and oxygen 16 were compared to one another. And uh, stages with uh, high levels of oxygen-18 uh, represented cold ice glacial periods, well, numbers, uh, odd number of stages, are tops with, uh, and they are, it's low values of oxygen-18, and that represents warm interglacial intervals, meaning there's no glaciers. This is the data over the past, uh, two million years, longer than that, five million years, derived from pollen and foraminifera, which are a type of plankton. And their remains are found, the fall fossils, uh, found in drilled marine ice, marine sediment cores. And it's from this information that we push on. Uh, the marine, the mid, it's considered the mid Brunus event. Uh, a lot of people will refer to it as that, but the Brunus event uh, is marked by a change in the Earth's magnetic polarity about uh, 800,000 YBP years before present, and uh, then uh, hasn't ended. So we're in it right now, and so uh, marine isotope stage 11 or MIS 11 is right in the middle of the Brunus uh, orientation of the magnetic pole, and that's why it's called the Mid-Brunus event. Let's see what else we can get. MIS at 11 represents the longest and warmest interglacial of the last 500 KY years. KY, equal, KY years equals a thousand years. And again, interglacial means no glaciers. And it was characterized by overall warm sea temperature, surface temperatures in the high latitudes. The high latitudes being the North Pole or the South Pole. 
Um, therefore, a lot more hurricanes, a lot more uh, tornadoes, and global sea level may have reached as much as uh, 20 meters above pre present. That's known. Although some authors claim 300 meters, that's about uh, a little over 100 feet. Um, and this is from looking at a number of, oh, that's a whole lecture in itself. Uh, West Antarctic ice sheet was gone, and Greenland ice sheets as well. And uh, well, some authors claim that the loss of the Antarctic ice sheet was instantaneously. It suddenly slid into the ocean. Then the question is, what caused it to slide into the ocean? Just like the whole ice sheet. A CO2 peak was not associated with any of this as it is now. So global warming uh, back then was not due to a spike in CO2, but just to uh, shrinkage of the uh, Antarctic ice sheets. That's another lecture as well. But it cannot be explained, MIS-11 can't be explained by astronomical processes like eccentricities in the Earth's orbit with the Milinkovitch cycles. It's considered an analog, um, MIS-11, to the present day situation of sea level rise although the global warming is today is due to the CO2 as opposed to what happened at MIS-11. So what does all this mean for Antarctica? Let's go back there and dig around and our object of, our subject of study. I'm sure all of you have seen this map before someplace. And there's Antarctica and I can over on the uh, your right hand side, uh, uh, you'll see West Antarctic and the West Antarctic ice sheet, which uh, ostensibly slid off. And it's in trouble now because the West Antarctic, all of these ice sheets are well grounded, uh, meaning they're sitting on hard rock. West Antarctic is a somewhat different. Uh, with sea level rise, sea is getting underneath the ice sheet itself and the bedrock. And so that raises the perspective of uh, West Antarctic's ice sheet just sliding off by itself. Well, back to uh, Jack's gravity profile taken from the sea to the South Pole. Uh, gravity meter is used to measure the pole of gravity. Pole is stronger over heavy rocks weaker over lighter rocks, and also reflects topography as shown in the upcoming profile. Gravity is measured in gals. One gal equals um, a gal for a Galileo, of course, um, is one centimeter per second squared, a unit of acceleration. Now, this is what Jack dug up on his uh, crossing his uh, crossing the uh, Antarctica, Wilkes Land Anomaly. And he took this as evidence for a possible hypervelocity impact crater and I published it in the Journal of Geophysical Research in 76, although he did the work in uh, 61. And another, another, uh, another group of people did work in 62 and uh, so did Rion, 1960. And <laughs> these profiles have aspect ratios, uh, greater depth versus greater width, that uh, exactly what you expect for an impact crater. Uh, there are rim structures uh, and, and central peaks, of course, circular basins. The gravity profiles are similar to those that, uh, that Jack, Jack discovered are similar to those of impact craters. Uh, the anomalies are uncharacteristic large. They're hardly what you expect for sol solely mantle related or geological crustal variations, running up to 
a minus 160 milligrams, unusual. Also, the anomaly gradients that is crossing over into the impact uh, area is anomalously large, and that's again characteristic of impact craters. Uh, then the ice covering the anomaly now is heavily crevassed, meaning it happened relatively rec recently, uh, and the gravity profiles with known impact sites does not allow dismissal that this might be a crater. Known impact, known rates of rebound and apparent lack of isostatic compensation proposed the suggest the impact was recent. Here's an actual impact uh, and that's the gravity's uh, profound taken over the Kelly West impact structure in Australia. So if I took uh, a line across that an appropriate uh, section, I would see just exactly what Jack picked up in his um, uh, survey. So what's isostatic compensation? Lots of new fancy terms we're throwing in here. Uh, it won't hurt to know them. Uh, those are tree stumps. Uh, they're lying under uh, the, the tide is out. This is a minus basin in uh, the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia. And uh, when the tide comes in, they will now lie under 16 meters of water at high tide. And all this compensation, they had to have been alive in the shore of some time. But this allows one to infer the rate of compensation. And that occurred with for about 4,500 years ago. Uh, uh, now, what happened, and this is simply the withdrawal of the ice sheet from the last glaciation. In fact, upstate New York is still rising and uh, Sag Harbor is sinking. Sorry to let you know. Uh, then tectites are thought to be melted terrestrial debris, uh, when the uh, meteor hits, it creates such a high temperature that a lot of material melts and uh, creating layers of ejecta thousands of kilometers away. And the location of the original gravity anomaly in Antarctica is located by the circle star all the way at the bottom. Uh, can you see that? There's a picture of uh, a diagram of Antarctica and Australia above it. And there's a star there indicating where uh, Jack ran into his first anomaly. And <clears throat> it looks like a, a text, uh, textile uh, tomb area. Yeah. So uh, then we. Now, these are modern times. That was done quite some time ago. But there was no reason to throw out the speculation that there may have been an, a major impact on Antarctica. So the work of the uh, satellites uh, yielded the following. So one thing, if you do an uh, isostatic yeah, come on, isostatic model, lithosphere model, uh, with the new data, you find it's not possible that the, the models they have fit to the observed gravity field. So nothing's an equilibrium, isostatic equilibrium uh, down there if we assume classical uh, isostasy. Now, this is what the uh, satellites have found. All the blue holes are gravity negatives. Or the one that says A is Jack's original uh, discovery. And uh, so 
suddenly you have a much more complicated picture. How do you deal with that? Well, this is Jack's original site from today's radio sounding perspective as a technique and a procedure uh, advanced in time from the 60s. Um, you can see the round circular gravity low and the pink gravity high representing the circle, the uh, central peak. And the reason it's sort of distorted is simply because it's uh, the ice field is moving into the sea and it's carrying it along the imprint of the impact as well. Now, it's recognized that there were impact sites in there were impacts in near South Africa, and a famous one is the Altana impact site. So to try and dismiss the situation on the grounds that nobody's ever found an impact site in the Antarctic area, uh, the Altana impact site uh, proves that incorrect. Uh, aeromagnetic map. That also applies. Uh, the, the analogy for models to have a very high magnetized source is the base of the ice sheet. Impact debris. And they found a number of these uh, round places. Uh, you see there's Q and there's P and R and S. Uh, these are all considered uh, impact sites, well, uh, they first thought it might be uh, volcanic calderas. This by uh, Parent, John Parent. Oh, okay, all volcanic, whether or not they marked the edge of a uh, caldera, that was his take on it. But an alternative interpretation of a meteor impact structure in a volcanic terrain can't be ruled out. So here's another, you see the round circular entity in the middle of this uh, blue, it's blue, uh, representing a, a deep <laughs> magnetic anomaly and the reds uh, uh, less so. And that's a known uh, impact site in South Carolina. Bolides, uh, uh, meteors, almost always break up in, in the atmosphere. And there's reasons for that, but that's a whole nother lecture. But they create strewn fields. Uh, depending on the research, 100% of those meteors break up completely. Uh, the Tilia Binks meteor, uh, a couple of years ago in Russia, turned into a fireball, broke up. They found little bits and pieces here and there, but uh, nothing remnant of any. Uh, what the damage was caused by the airburst and in coming into the uh, Earth's atmosphere. Oh, we'll look at scattery ellipses. Uh, strewn fields in Australia, uh, Siberia, uh, and China. The large impactors are at the fore part and smaller impactors at the after part of the apparent scatter lifts. And uh, these are from known impact sites elsewhere. And this is what they look like with the right now the apparent scatter that's drawn from the uh, gravity measurements, inferred from the gravity measurements uh, in Antarctica. And the uh, image of each uh, dark image uh, represents a gravity, a negative gravity anomaly, a possible hit. Now I've turned this around. It's the same uh, 
scatter ellipse because that's the only way I can in incorporate this into a geologic map of Antarctica. Now, that a whole number of different terrains, not at all related to one another, uh, and all of different ages. This brings up a conundrum, and uh, they're all separated uh, where you see the Ross origin, meaning uh, tectonic activity, uh, mountain building, things of that nature, running down the whole length of uh, Antarctica. Uh, and that's the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. <coughs> the west, uh, on one side is the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, and the other side is the East Antarctic Ice Sheet. They're not uh, common to a particular terrain. For instance, if they're common to the Great Town I just showed you, uh, we could say the, uh, whatever one and cause those anomalies had to do with the local ge geology that is spread across a number of geologies uh, makes it uh, not very, makes it very difficult to suggest these anomalies formed by processes within the earth. Seafloor coring, what does that tell us? Here's a core going over the side, it's just a biopsy of the seafloor. They turn that upside down, and that's what it looks like before it hits the sea floor. Uh, the trigger core hits first, and that causes the uh, core to drop and penetrate the sea floor. And then finally, they hold up their sample of their biopsy, biopsy sample of the sea floor and then examine it. And this is what they did, for instance, with the Altanen cores <coughs> in the Ross Sea, Antarctica. A larger dots, impact glass was found. Microtectides were discovered. Uh, the inferred age of the impact layer was late Pliocene. Um, the cores themselves, they were able to take the cores themselves, but uh, that's the Altanen core is something quite different from and uh, quite removed from uh, what we're discussing. But in these cores, one got uh, partially melted ilmenite, uh, melted uh, potassium chloride, tectide silica glass, magnetic susceptibility of those sources in the core taking containing all of those above. So this is what, uh, how allow, what allowed them to conclude the core they took, uh, the Altanen took, represented an impact. And a number of people who worked on this uh, were Peregrine Gerard Little, and I knew her somewhat, Della Sabbath. Uh, I don't know very well. Dee Brigger knew very well, and, well, and Lloyd Berkel I knew very well. So their work is um, trying to locate the impact site. So the problem with putting it out where they did was the source crater for the impact. Uh, tectites and the impact glass had to lie in the northern part of the Ross, Ross Sea. Where the tectonic bearing layer was thickest, but there's no topographic depression, not found at all. So the ocean, and then the source crater cannot lie in the oceanic crust, as the tectonic bearing layers contain quartz. Meaning that had to be some uh, land process, and so the source. Peter must lie on a continental shelf or may either be extremely small or have been obscured by glacial outwash. Now, attempting to assess impact uh, effects in icy terrains, we ought to look how it, how it uh, if we can find anything that's got ice in it, we should try and compare. And it's a common wisdom that 
uh, the soil on uh, the regolith on Mars is, for all practical purposes, ice just filled with lots of sand and grit and things of that nature. And uh, here's a splotch crater. You can see the splotch lines running out. And the central peak that characterizes these craters as well as the rims. Uh, so an impact produced surge deposits on the south coast of Ma Madagascar, which is looking towards Antarctica. Something like that, similar, there's similar uh, stuff like that in New Zealand and, Antar and in Australia as well. So the Russians have found other uh, meteorite structures in uh, the Ross Sea. Uh, outside of that, outside of the Altanen uh, impact site. And the, uh, what's peculiar about all of these is there's a lot of unconsolidated, there's a lot of planktonic uh, 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 material deposited. Aeolian means wind and they were deposited at a much later stage. And so there's such, uh, um, so the question is how do they get out of the ocean and land on top of uh, the drip cap caps of the glaciers on Antarctica? Uh, diatoms, that's what they look like. So this aeolian transport, uh, of um, Iowa Pleistocene diatoms. They know which uh, period in the Earth's history they belong to. And all of this, they have all of this stuff uh, in high elevation deposits, um, high, la high la altitude trans Antarctic mountain sites. How did they get out of the ocean? Impact. Same thing from acquired uh, uh, by other uh, scientists. What's interesting, though, is that in the, uh, the in spite of uh, transporting all of these uh, dead planktons and things of that nature. Uh, all the way to the South Pole, the um, purple noted planktons were also uh, reported and lodged in uh, cracks in the meteorites. So how did all of these fossil plankton get lodged in the meteorites? All of these questions are tied to Jack's original uh, conjecture. And uh, then there was a French effort that looked at this. These are some of the people, uh, well, microfossils in the, uh, in the Antarctic ordinary chondrites, terrestrial ones. In cracks. And a chondrite is a meteorite that's got um, is composed of little marbles that have been stuck together. That's what it looks like, chondrules. And so they're given a special name, chondrites. And all of these fossils span different areas, uh, different eras, stuck in these uh, cracks in these uh, meteors, meteorites. These are the course that the French took off of the uh, Antarctica. They embraced White House first impact site. And the, it's the, you see the little red dots on the, uh, over toward your left. You'll see the, very, the three cores they took. And they found that the 
in those cores, ejected debris, impact glass, impact redshift, that means broken up material, melted and completely melted marine glass, meaning uh, pieces of broken up rock, uh, volcanic, volcano classic sandy mudstone, everything you do associate with a someplace with a uh, impact uh, to create all, all of this material. It was considerably thickness in some places. The impact injector up to seven meters thick, or maybe pushing about 22 feet. And I'll not read everything that they did, but these are the people who worked on this and coughed up these uh, assessments of these uh, cores taken by the French. So there is a body of uh, people out there who uh, have done work to support. Uh, well, here I missed one, which might be good. If you look down at the bottom, uh, Radiolarian species, that's a plectonic uh, fossil of Antarctic origin, an impact ejecta blocks from Syria. So this stuff flew all the way across from the lowest part of the lower hemisphere to the upper. Um, more and more of these people, and the only reason I'm throwing these up is um, Again, everybody has jumped into this and um, all of this because of our suggestion in Japan that maybe we ought to take a look at some of the cores. All right, so a number of people just come up with more and more uh, observations to support the impact type hypotheses. So what we did suggest in Japan was to take ice cores. We examined the ice cores to see the, poss well, the possibility of impacts. These are ice cores, obviously. And from the cores, uh, a significant meteoritic event on a thousand times greater than present fluxus, which occurred uh, about the time of MIS 11. The range between the cores is several thousands of kilometers across uh, Antarctica. And at the same time, evidence was found strewn in the trans Antarctic mountains, which is also removed from the core size by several thousand kilometers. Well, the, uh, the erosions jumped into this as well. And um, their work indicated that a huge media right. This is, of course, this is a, their public publication, which I'm sure is charged up. Uh, but they indicated a huge media right rammed into Antarctica about 180,000 years ago. Well, this is what the Tunguska event did knocked down all of these trees. The famous event that took place in about 1908, I think on June 30th, in, Raj, in Siberia. Um, and there's more of it. Um, the, um, you can see the, all the timber laid out uh, away from the impact site. Or was it an impact? Nobody's ever found any indication of uh, the uh, material that composed the meteor. And there's the so-called meteor site right in the center. Nothing in there to, um, so the question is, big question is, what happened? Okay. Um, all right, so now what the uh, Imperial College people are saying is we've got something, uh, very much like Tunguska, um, and uh, what they're trying to figure out, what caused it. And 
also discovered another drilling, during drilling vice course in Asian Antarctica, within the scope of the of Dome C and Dome Fuji project, re, revealed revealed high similar tape between the the debris found in ice cores and particles. Uh, but again, the that distance between these two uh, two regions about three hundred thousand kilometers. All right, so even more people are finding uh, more materials suggesting something happened uh, about four hundred thirty thousand years ago. So. Our speculations motivated successful searches and established the occurrence of major impact events. These coincided with the initiation MIS 11, which has been believed to have been accompanied by the loss of the entire West Antarctic ice sheet, leading perhaps to a 30 meter rise in sea level. Well, this is what it will do to. Uh, New Jersey, New York. I have nothing concerning Sag Harbor. Maybe it's safe. I don't know. The uh, you can see the Hudson River running up as a single line running up on one side <coughs> of the New Jersey swamps, so to speak, and. Uh, well, Brooklyn's found in the whole situation. Florida's in even worse shape. California, Central Valley is ruined, and that's a major uh, agriculture production area, uh, which would hit the whole world. I mean, nothing but salt in there. And that's the Delta for it. Uh, uh, New Orleans swamped. Netherlands gone underwater. The Po uh, area, Delta. That's swamp too. You can see, uh, if you look, you can pick out Venus. And if they're worried about being in swamp these days, they sure would have been swamped back then. And that's the Nile Delta. So what happens is the West Antarctic ice sheet suddenly slides off into the ocean, surfs up, does anybody recognize the um, bridge? No? That's the Golden Gate at San Francisco. The end, or is it? Well, that's a whole nother topic. There are other uh, lectures that could be given here, but I hope I haven't uh, I might do with too many unknown uh, words with a new vocabulary, things of this nature. If anybody got any question, I'm here to deal with them. Feel free to type it in the chat and I can read it out loud for you if you want to come off mute and ask Professor Rice your question. Go ahead. Alan, what was the diameter of the crater? Uh, 200 uh, kilometers, the original one. <clears throat> we have um, one participant asking if you would um, be if you would share your slides, what do you think? Yeah, sure. Okay, you can send it to me later and I'll get that to people. 
Okay, another qu question from Patricia. What was the last meteorite that fell on Earth? What was the last what? Meteorite that fell on Earth. Oh, they're falling all every day. They're raining on us. A little, little tiny ones, dust particles, everything. <clears throat> and we've had a number of um, fireballs in the past couple of months in the United States. So uh, it's an ongoing process. There's a lot of, let alone the junk we put up there. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there. Hi, this is Julia. I was wondering if you could explain um, if you attribute the, did you say the, the switching of the polarity? Did you have that in there or just the, just gravity? I'm, I'm sorry. Attributed to the, the attributed to the meteorite. Was I cutting out? Uh, shifting the polarity? Yeah, the, the earth, the, when the, um, when the magnetic fields flipped, yeah. would you attribute that to an event as a, a meteorite? Uh, nobody's attributed the flip to any meteoritic event. Hmm. And there's been a lot of flips. Um, that's not the only one. So there's magnetic field has reversed itself time and time again. Mm -hmm. And cataloging all these magnetic events uh, has given us a good uh, calendar for us to identify a date and time when some geological process took place. And does that answer, does that help? Yeah, it does. I think I, maybe I was confusing it with the, the different uh, yeah. fields of gravity. Would those th two things be related, polarity and gravity? Well, you know, <clears throat> the whole um, business of the flipping um, magnetic field, um, a number of people think they've got it uh, wrapped up uh, and others are not sure. Uh, but I, I'm sure there's more work to be done on that, find out what the, what's going on elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. We have another question in the chat uh, from Patricia. How, or Patria, sorry, I've been saying your name wrong. Um, how come we don't hear about any impacts uh, no matter how small. Um, we come, we don't hear anything about the meteors that land, no matter how small. The small ones, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because, um, well, if you go out and look at the meteor showers that come with some regularity, the proceeds and um, entities like that, which you people advertise uh, for others to go out and take a look at. Um, there's so many of them that come in. <laughs> how do you classify how, uh, the number that land on the planet is uh, per second is innumerable. So uh, we're not the northern hemisphere is not the only area that gets hit. And then the other thing is uh, uh, how do you record them in the uh, southern ocean? Indian Ocean, vast areas of water disappear. And um, they just have to catch these things by chance. Uh, how, how am I, you know, they're not quite as thick as pollen, but they're pretty thick. So, well, if you want to take that up as a research project, uh, I'll. I'll I'd be glad to see that happen. Helen, what's the smallest, um, I guess, diameter of a, meteor a meteorite to to make a crater? What was the what? what was how how large does a meteorite have to be to actually create a create a, to create a crater when it falls? Um, 
Well, that brings us to another point, and that is why I have, or is it, as we've reached another point in our research, is what, do these things actually hit, get to the ground, or they do they create a big explosion that it knocks a hole in the earth? Uh, they do break up, obviously, because you can find meteors everywhere uh, on the ground, meteorites, actually. Uh, meteor is what you see streaking through the sky, and uh, so people report these, and people go out because you have to see the um, you you can you see them at night usually because of the flare from the burning from them burning up as they enter the atmosphere, and not all of them, of course, make it to the ground before they're completely consumed. Um, uh, it's a uh, guess that there's maybe several uh, thousand kilograms of uh, meteor, meteorites that hit the Earth, that accumulate on the Earth per day. So the Earth is getting more and more, getting bigger and bigger. But uh, <laughs> a thousand uh, kilograms of meteorites is nothing compared to the size of the earth or the weight of the earth or the mass of the earth. Any other questions? I love questions. I don't see any more. I really look for questions I can't answer. How about heavy water? What is what is that? Heavy what water. Meteor, yeah, with meteorites. Do what is that? Do tear? Uh, well, that's another topic. Um, water is H two O. Do you recall that? Yep. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, two hydrogens attached to. One oxygen that makes you regular water. Now there are isotopes, maybe that have the same chemistry, the same number of protons uh, involved in their chemistry, but they may have one or two extra neutrons, or be may may be missing a neutron. And uh, if I in my H two O, if one of the hydrogens has an extra neutron attached to it, deuterium, oh, got it, number two, or three neutrons attached uh, some, somehow to either of the um, hydrogens. Then you have tritium, uh, and uh, you can make uh, ice cubes of that. And they're good because there's more mass to them by the addition of the neutrons. Uh, they won't float. You can take, there's, uh, look it up on the web, you can take, uh, they'll show you where they drop these things into a uh, beaker of water, regular water, and they go straight to the bottom. So, uh, but he uh, heavy water is a whole entity into itself. For one thing, it's useful in digging out the material needed to make bombs. That's Ooh. one thing. And um, the other uh, thing, the tritium, that's often, that's radioactive. So it's often, it doesn't stay together because it doesn't want all of those neutrons around. It breaks apart and that's used in medicine. And, uh, so, but that you're talking about a whole course, not just a even. Mm -hmm. a, I thought it had a connection to meteorites. I thought I remember reading that. Um, a connection with meteorites? Yeah, that it was uh, trans that somehow it had been transported here and, and then it, it led to uh, other. Well, there, there's so much. Uh, uh, well, tritium has such a short half life. 
it's hard for me to see meteorites, which are four and a half billion years old, uh, carrying much uh, tritium uh, into the earth. And although now the tritium has a longer half-life, I think they would come in clean, meaning just plain old water. But I'll have to think, I've not seen that before in the literature. And so I will look that and write that down and uh, look it up. I thank you for that. Well, thank you. I'm going to re-Google re -Google it again also. <laughs> it was a very interesting I didn't topic. hear that. I'm, not, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to Google it again, too, to see if I, I'm remembering right. But thank you for this discussion. It's uh, I, I love your slides. I'd like to go back and read them because I see you put a lot of notes in there. So that's uh, well, I nice hope to it, delve into that. Yeah. Well, I hope it acquainted you with a lot of different scientific uh, disciplines. And uh, that's what... Absolutely. Now, some of these people get locked into one little game, like um, they're an expert on jade, and, and they think that's all there is. And if you try and bring something else into their lives, they just dismiss it. So it's... Keep in mind, there's a lot of connection, interconnection between these things. Yeah, hey, I think we have time for one more question, which we have in the chat. Oh, well, I think we could do two if that's all right, if everyone's okay, staying a couple minutes. So Kim asks, uh, are the meteorites magnetically attracted to Antarctica as opposed to the Arctic? Um, no, I think that the magnetic field of the Earth is not very strong. And it will be, it would have to be iron meteorites that would respond to that. And they're per going pretty damn fast when they're zipping through. So I think that would be a perturbation that we wouldn't see much response to. Um, and if they, they might, the meteorite might sense it like you would a mosquito to brush it off and push on through wherever it was going, or come in all by itself uh, due to the Earth's gravitational field. That's where all of these things come in, get pulled in, and trapped in the Earth's uh, gravitational field. Okay, hey, great. And then a question from Donna. Uh, is there any difference between the information that can be provided by meteorites found in cold climates like Antarctica and those found in arid desert climates? Uh, now I understand, <clears throat> is there any difference in the distribution of meteorites between cold? Uh, is there any difference in the information you can gather from meteorites that you find in cold climates versus arid desert climates? Well, you do find meteorites in Egypt. <laughs> That's an uh, arid, hot climate. <clears throat> However, that opens up a, a whole new lecture because a lot of <laughs> questions are attending that. Uh, it, what's happened now is uh, people have shown by flyby or uh, getting a good grip at last on the volume of some of these uh, 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 asteroids that the asteroids are really uh, dust bunnies. And there's, uh, they, except for Ceres, has enough gravitational pull in it to uh, maybe uh, secure some metamorphization, metamorphic work to solidify it, but it barely holds itself together. Uh, and then the rest of these, uh, so the question is, what is going on? If all of the, see, when all of this game started about asteroid impact and things of this nature, nobody had gone out there yet. And now they're getting out looking at these asteroids like Ryugyu and Bennu, uh, which have material you'd associate with a high density, but say 3.5, or if they're solid iron, eight grams per cc. And no, they've got maybe one or two 
1.5 gram per cc, two grams per cc. So either the voids fill the water or something like that. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Science is great, it never ends. And don't take anything as the biblical truth. That's a, that goes into something else. Uh, the, um, uh, so tomorrow, don't expect tomorrow's uh, uh, fact to be something else. End up displaced, as was uh, Newton's laws had to be adjusted to account for Einstein's work. That came some 200 years after uh, Newton proposed F equals MA, which uh, is still in use today. <laughs> you said 99% of the time, and maybe Einstein's relationship 1% of the time, uh, and that doesn't denigrate either one. Uh, but then like, that's a whole nother course, not just a lecture. And our Germain library needs somebody to teach him. Of course, I'm just like, hi, heavens. Be glad to help out. Oh, thank you, Professor Rice. It was a great lecture. I think we're all inspired to uh, research some of these questions. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll get those slides to you and um, check out the Hamptons Observatory website. And we have all kinds of databases if you do want to do research at the library on this stuff. Very good. And, uh, and look, you've been recording it. Yeah. Yeah. You've been recording. And so I can uh, have other friends who couldn't make it. Uh, and get a, a recording of this? Yeah, we can get that to you. Great, that'll be grand. Um, my daughter being one. Well, okay, uh -huh. am, I, <laughs> uh, am I dismissed to go up to the American Hotel and get my pint? I think so. <laughs> Have a great night, everybody. <laughs> yeah, pleased to meet you all. Enjoy your night, thank you.